I'll begin by painting and assembling the Ruby Hilted Dagger inspired by the Wheel of Time series. Once the prop is complete, I'll go into more detail on the process of how this design came to be. The first step was to base coat almost the entire prop using a metallic gold. The grip has fine gold wire detailing modeled into it, and that's going to be a bright gold. But the end caps, I'm going to leave them black for now, and later they'll become silver. On the scabbard, I've focused the gold tone onto the top and the bottom. In the center area, I've left more muted, so that looks like it's made with a different material, possibly a leather. I also mixed in some burnt umber and a muted yellow color to provide some variation to that pure metallic. And for the cross guard, I based out the entire center using gold for starters, and then brushed some silver over the top and the bottom. On the blades, I'm doing a base coat of bright silver. Now, I have two here, one printed in a gray filament and one printed in black. So you can see the difference there on that first coat of how the under color does shine through. For the cross guard, I decided to change the background to the silver color and highlight just the serpents using the gold. So I first applied the metallic silver and then I did a wash over everything using some blue mixed with black that's going to create some contrast with the warm gold over the cool silver. On the hilt I'm adding in some silver and some of the burnt umber and a bit of orange and then wiping most of that away just doing a series of washes so that I can highlight that texture that's built into the model. Once I had a good base, I added some sealer over top of that so I could add more washes on top without damaging this base coating. On the serpents, I added orange gold highlights and cool gray shadows to build up the contrast in the color temperature. I also added just a little bit of the brightest highlight by mixing a bit of very bright silver into the gold and dotting that onto each of the scales. I did a bit of outlining also with some black around the edges to make that the highest contrast possible. And then on the silver areas, I just brushed various tones of metallic silver and gray to build up some interest on those flat surfaces and also to darken the details that are modeled into the piece. Now to make that blade a bit more interesting. So I'm using a couple of different shades of metallic silver plus some gray and a little bit of white so that I can add sort of reflections onto this. Even though the metallic is somewhat reflective, it's not the same as something that's been chromed, for example. So it's not really going to be truly reflective. It will catch the light just with the shimmering mica, but it does add a bit more interest to add some different tones of silver along with those non-metallic paints. I wasn't quite careful enough with the blending here and keeping any fibers and whatnot out of the paint and ensuring that it was properly diluted so it wouldn't clump up. So this one ended up needing to be sanded down. So I used the gray base blade for this final one and then I will fix the other blade later on. Any surface imperfections with the metallic paints become very apparent so that's a time when it's really important to ensure that the paint goes on smoothly. Back to that hilt, I'm adding some finishing touches by adding the darkest darks into some of the crevices, especially towards the top and the bottom, and then I brushed a bit more bright gold and even just a touch of that silver in there just to put some more pronounced highlights onto that gold wrapping. I increased the contrast on the scabbard by adding some washes of black and brown into all the crevices and then just wiping most of it away from the flat surfaces. The center area has the most texture, it hasn't been sanded, so it does pick up more of that wash. 
Also in the area where there's the text and the details engraved into the top and bottom, I want to ensure that those catch a good amount of wash so that it stands out against the gold. Once I was finished with the darker tones, my golds were a bit dulled, so I did go back in with some more of the gold to brighten up all the areas that need to stand out most. I also added some of the warm highlights using the orange and some silver, just like with the rest of the gold, so these all look like they're made from the same metal. I always add some silver to my gold for the highlights. I find just plain gold looks really flat and uninteresting, but once you add in just a touch of that bright silver, it enhances the metallic effect. Throughout the process, I compared the parts to each other to ensure that I was doing the same effect on all the different areas so that these will look cohesive once they're assembled. On the hilt, I decided last minute that that bottom ring where the ruby will be installed, that it needed to be gold. It didn't look quite right silver and the ruby will stand out more against the gold. So I added the same gold process to this end ring with a base coat of plain gold, some warm highlights, and then a bit of that silver just for the brightest sprites. With the painting done, I did add a coat of lacquer off camera before proceeding to installing the ruby. To put this in place, I mixed up a bit of epoxy resin and I added some kind of copper gold mica powder so that any of the areas that show up on the sides will look cohesive with the rest of the design. The stone was placed into the epoxy and any excess was wiped away. I just had to ensure that the ruby was approximately centered. This is a natural stone, so it's not perfectly symmetrical or anything, so I just positioned it to where it looked correct and then allowed that to cure. Next I needed to create a liner for the scabbard. Since the inside surface is somewhat textured and it's not a perfectly tight fit, I left space intentionally so that I could line it with fabric to ensure that the paint didn't wear off over time against the texture of the printed surface. For this I chose some natural colored linen and stitched a hem on the bottom. I used a pattern just traced off of the blade itself to create a pocket that the knife would slide into. And then I attempted to place this into the scabbard. Now I'd already done a mock-up version and it seemed to work okay. So this was the final version with all the edges nicely stitched. nearly went in all the way and then it got stuck on the hem so I removed the knife and pressed everything in trying to get it positioned. I fiddled with this for quite a while and kept trying to get it into position. I even went in and stitched it a little bit smaller along the side since it seemed there was extra fabric. In the end though this fabric just wasn't the right choice. There was not quite enough clearance left in the model for such a thick fabric but also the linen has quite a bit of texture to it and I was concerned that over time this would cause damage to the finish on the knife. So I scrapped that one and started on version number three with a new fabric. This is leftover from the very first project that I ever posted on this channel and it has a soft velvet like texture on one side which I've placed towards the blade. That should offer enough grip to hold the scabbard in place around the knife, but not so much that it's difficult to remove. The other benefit is that this is a no fray fabric, so there's no need for a hem adding extra bulk at the bottom. To attach this in place, I'm using tacky glue. This gave me some time to position the fabric and also any glue that gets onto the outside surface isn't gonna cause damage to the paint since it's non-solvent based and I could just wipe it away once I had the fabric in position. 
While that was drying, I glued the rest of the knife together using Gorilla Glue. So the three parts just slide into each other. There is a little bit of wiggle room there, which will be filled in as the Gorilla Glue expands. So I was careful to get this positioned properly and check on it periodically as it was curing to ensure that if there was any excess that was wiped away and that the blade stayed center on the hilt and the cross guard. I also double checked myself to make sure I had put the blade facing the correct way before I left it to dry. The resin for the ruby was mostly cured at this point too, so I didn't have to worry about that falling out. So that's how I painted and finished the dagger, but now let's take a look at the process for how I came to this design solution. I began by researching the description in the Wheel of Time books and also looking at references of historical artifacts and reproductions I sketched in my notebook to record different ideas and then I moved to mocking things up in cardboard. It's nice to have a tangible version, a knife that you can actually hold in your hand and see how the proportions look and feel. Once I had a version that I kind of liked, I took a photo and imported that into Fusion and then I finally started the actual 3D modeling process. I revised the design a lot once I was 3D modeling, but it's just nice to have something to base that off of. I can iterate a lot faster using cardboard mockups versus jumping straight into 3D modeling where you spend more time on actually how to model it versus just getting through a bunch of ideas and finding something that works. To create the model itself, I used the same process as for the dragon, so I'll add a link for the video on how to model organic shapes in Fusion 360. I then exported all of the parts and 3D printed them using matte fiber HDPLA by Protopasta. For the most part, they print without supports other than just the cross guard. To get a blade that has sharp, clean edges, I sliced it down the center and printed each side flat on the print bed, and then I attached them together using some epoxy resin. I did just the center first and clamped those together and allowed that to cure. Then I also smoothed the outside using more epoxy. I did that in two stages just so that I could ensure the pieces were properly aligned during the joining stage and then focus on just the smoothing for the second part. Because of the print orientation, the print lines here were more pronounced. So that's why on this piece, I wanted to use the epoxy. This process also adds some strength to the part, and since it is very thin, that's a plus. I used the heat gun to remove any bubbles before allowing these to cure. After curing, then they still need to be sanded smooth, so I used the sanding block and some 220 grit sandpaper for the most part, just to get these pretty smooth. It's important to use a sanding block here so that the bevels stay even. Then the very last part, I switched over just to sanding without the block with some 400 grit paper just to ensure that there were no burrs left on the edges. And there's both versions all smoothed out and ready for paint. With the cross guard, this was the only piece that had some support structure, and I did add some custom supports there to get the best possible print quality. They don't remove perfectly, but the overall quality is still better than the auto supports. The scabbard prints very cleanly on the outside, but there is a little bit of stringing on the inside, so I used a file to remove all of those burrs. I also sanded the top and bottom section smooth using the prepping weapon and some 220 grit paper. For the text and the engraved details, I used a very small needle file just to clean out all of those lines and ensure that everything was clear and smooth. I also sanded that base where the supports were and a little bit on the top too because of the angle I printed it at, there were some print lines there. So I just smoothed that out. I also sanded smooth 
just a little bit on the serpents so that the scales and the face of the serpent would have a slightly smoother texture than the backdrop just for added contrast. I again used the needle file to clear out all of the small details on that piece also. Just a little bit of sanding to do on the hilt, again just to get that contrast in texture by smoothing the top and bottom pieces and leaving the center portion with the natural texture from the filament. The cross guard was still somewhat uneven on that bottom portion where the supports were, so I just used a bit of brushable super glue to fill in the small divots. I allowed that to dry and then was able to sand that nice and smooth. Because these were such small imperfections, this was the easiest way to take care of that. So that's the basic process that went into designing and prepping this prop before moving on to paint and assembly. I tried to hit all of the descriptions that were given in the Wheel of Time series. We have the pronounced curve in the blade, we have the cross guard in the style of Keons with gold serpents with fangs bared, you have a hilt that's wrapped in fine gold and then a ruby capping the hilt. Finally then you have the scabbard which is made from gold and we have some strange symbols worked onto that. So I think that I covered everything as described and then just filled in the missing details. The scabbard ended up fitting really really well so that was definitely the better choice using the velvety style fabric. It is tight enough that it's not going to fall off, but the knife is also not difficult to remove. So there we have it. That is my take on the ruby-hilted dagger from the Wheel of Time. <laughs>